I'm really, really excited about um, the next series of podcasts we're doing, a sort of trilogy around large deal pursuit. And it's a, a topic, as some of you may know, that's really close to my heart as um, I did my doctorate very much in this space back in 2004 uh, to 2008, or was it nine, that I, I finally graduated in it. And I'll probably refer back to the doctorate and my research findings as um, I interview my, my, next, uh, my next guest. And I'm so, so excited to have David with us. Um, David, um, I'm going to ask David to introduce himself to you in a short while. But within the trilogy series that we've got, we've invited uh, a number of people who are responsible for the large large deal pursuit winning um kind of activities and and david is is very much um uh, sort of central to what we're hoping to achieve and 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 to learn from some of his experiences and his his background so david a huge and warm welcome to the consale yourselves transformation series <laughs> that we have here welcome well, hi, thanks very much for the invitation and uh, looking forward to the conversation yeah, me too. Um, normally for our listeners, we, we ask um, uh, people to sort of do a short introduction of themselves. And so, David, I wonder if we could start with you explaining a little bit more about who you are, you know, and your background and, and how did you get into this kind of role that you're now doing at, uh, at Bunzel? Okay. So, uh, yeah, hello, everybody. I'm, as I say, I'm David Mines. Um, 50, year, 50 years old now, um, been in Congratulations. Sales. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, been in uh, sales now for uh, 28 years, which is a long time. But I think my love affair with sales started um, when I was quite young and, and probably unusually, I think I knew I wanted to be in sales from quite a young age. I grew up surrounded by salespeople or entrepreneurs who were running businesses. So. Um, from a very young age, I was exposed to what sales was. Uh, my father was a sales director for a large mining company. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I kind of knew what sales was about. Um, and also when I, again, when I was, I think it was about 15, 16, it's a long time ago now, uh, I had a, um, a weekend job, um, a Sunday job in a garden center. And um, uh, it was a great way of, of, of meeting people, seeing how business ran um and uh uh yeah just doing some till work and things like that but uh, engaging with with people who like i say i always find quite fascinating and I had the opportunity to then to do some um, um some sales activity there um again bear in mind quite young didn't really know much about some sales techniques at that point but um, um selling plants or selling some furniture there and I found it relatively easy. Um, I found it very enjoyable, that interaction between the, the salesperson and, and the client and um, found it a sort of very natural process. So I um, so did that for a number of years, all the way up to pretty much university. Uh, and then I went to university um, to study applied environmental science, which now is obviously very topical. Um, mm. But I came out of university not totally knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so I uh, looked for a range of range of roles and um, I joined a, a large uh, a plastic returnable transit packaging company, which was international, very large, um, just as a sales administrator. Um, I think with the view of finding then something else that I wanted to do. Um, but absolutely loved the role, um, supporting the sales team um, and supporting the clients in in their journey of placing their orders, making sure everything uh, went smoothly and so forth. So I had that basis of understanding what does a sales administrator do? How does a business function? What are the challenges within the business to make sure that we could fulfill orders and, and, and so forth? Um, and then the sales director at the time, um, uh, I think noticed that there were some sales coming through that couldn't really be allocated to a salesperson. Um, and that was 
effectively from from myself and that was just doing the basics of well yeah you've you've ordered x number of products if you ordered a few more yeah you could fill a truck mm -hmm. and therefore you get a cheap price on your transport why don't you just i suppose not knowing what it was at the time but effectively doing a bit of upselling to um to mm -hmm. make it better for the client and seeing if you could sort of drive some value to the client and and you know i i owe that gentleman quite a lot of uh uh uh, kudos to my career, I guess, because he started me properly on the journey into sales. Because um, mm -hmm. he then took me and said, "Oh, why don't you? We'll give, arm you with a phone. We'll give you some training around telesales. You know, could you generate leads for the salespeople?" And and sort of very quickly, um, sort of progressed from that into a regional sales role. And I was looking back at my uh, my records, um, doing a bit of reflection, and that journey started in 1995. And in that, uh, and in the next five years, I went from being effectively a sales administrator to becoming the national sales manager, which would be equivalent of a sales director within that particular organization. Um, mainly because growing, and I suppose my journey then into, I suppose, business development started really back then, because um, in the first year, you know, growing the set, my territory by 50%, the following year, 60%. Um, so I then kind of progressed through that company incredibly quickly. And I reflect back on that. I think that was a bit of a curse um, because in that five years, I, again, I was incredibly young. Was managing people who were significantly older than me um, and had been on that journey more out of my, I suppose, sales ability, but then got myself in a position where I was incredibly senior with the organization, expected to to know everything that um, a sales director would know at an incredibly young age. And I just didn't. I didn't have the training at that perspective. Mm -hmm. There was a massive gap between, I suppose, a, dare I say, a natural sales ability and having a professional sales knowledge. And, uh, and I think that then, I suppose, had a legacy um, for a couple of years that I needed then to fill that gap. Um, and sort of three years after taking um, that uh, national sales role, again, successful within it, um, in my first year of filling that role, the overall business grew by 31%. So mm. you could argue, well, that's, that's a successful story, surely. But after three years, I think I kind of looked and thought, oh, I kind of need to move on now. I need to get some more experience, see how a different business worked. Um, and from that sort of uh, sort of tender age, I think I would have been what around sort of twenty seven, I guess. Um, yeah. Then went into sales director roles thereafter. So I suppose I've done a sales director role or a director role for twenty one years. Um, so uh, right. had, um, yeah, it's successful in all of those those roles. Um, but I think I came to a point where. Um, uh, I also decided to pursue, which was an itch I think I always wanted to scratch, um, a, a, a taking on like a, a, an equity um, stake in a, in a new venture with a with a um, somebody who was re running an existing business at the time. It was created by our own sort of entrepreneurial business. I think at that point I thought I want to I want to own my own business. I want to sort of have a part of a of a business, um, and that was again successful. Um, but after that that journey, I kind of really looked at myself and thought there was a real gap, gap here in my knowledge, and that's where I I joined, interestingly enough, Bunzel um, for their one of their packaging divisions, um, and part of that decision to move into um, to join Bunzel was actually around training and filling that gap that I'd had for many many years of how do I become more professional still relatively young at this stage but how do i become more professional mm -hmm. um and, and and filling those gaps that's a bit of i suppose a uh a whistle stop tour yeah, of those, no, it, <laughs> my career to, well, I, to I, around now I guess yeah it but it's you know it it's really it's uh it's a really interesting background and thanks for sharing and um it's interesting within the sales profession that you know various studies have been done about uh, sort of social mobility and it's surprising that sales is one of those professions that isn't very mobile socially you know so meaning that it's a bit like you know sort of 
doctors, if you've got parents who've been doctors, you, you quite often find that children are drawn into that sort of profession. Yeah. And it's the same with sales. And I, I find that a little bit surprising um, because um, it's not like sales has got many entry barriers in, in the sense of academic, you know, you don't need to be a straight A student to get into sales. Um, whereas you do need to be a straight A student to to get into medicine and so on. But it's surprisingly, um, uh, on on the various research statistics, sort of, it's it's not a particularly, you know, people don't go into sales unless there's some sort of connection, or they fall into it completely by accident. So in your story, you know, with your father and and his roles, I can see that, you know, clearly you were taken with the with the profession, and um, uh, and uh, you know, I think that that's obviously you have natural. It's, it's interesting. We can, as you were talking, I was thinking. Uh, you real. I think you realised in your the early stages of your sales career that your natural ability got you so far, but that there was a gap that was missing, which you called being more professional, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, and sort of realised, you know. Um, that there was more to learn, and, and perhaps you you put yourself into situations where you were quite stretched from a management point of view or a leadership point of view, which is which is quite interesting. And it also raises the question: I think um, one of the sort of challenges again in our profession is if you are good at sales um, and you know, you know, you're hitting your targets, you're hitting your numbers, uh, or you're exceeding them. Um, the natural response from your employer is, oh, okay, well, we better do something with this person, otherwise they will leave. We will promote them into yeah. managerial roles. And you yeah, you increasingly remove them away from what they're actually good at. And I think one thing I, I quite like um, about yourself, Phil, and, and what you're doing is that professionalizing of sales and, and um improving mm. sort of their, I suppose the career journey or making their make sure there is a career journey for a salesperson because i think it, it is criminal i've seen so many um talented sales people be promoted into managerial roles which they're just not ready for or don't actually enjoy um i think one of the benefits now in my current position is is that um i'm in a very senior role within uh, within the businesses that I operate in within within Bunzel, um, but effectively still doing that cold face um, deal negotiation and under the banner of business yeah. development and grow and growing the the business, um, yeah, and being able to do actually what you enjoy and um, and hopefully are good at. Well, uh, I get uh, again you you raise such a great point and it, and I think that. There is a natural assumption that to progress in sales, you know, the progression is, you know, sort of like like you've done, sort of sales leadership, and and that this um, and that and that that um, people don't realise in sales that actually you can progress in different ways within sales, and and you're a great example of that, where where um, you know if your skills are in the creative process of finding and winning sort of large complex sales actually it, it's a it's a fantastic career path for people in sales that um and it's a really important function of sales that ability to be able to uh sort of manage very complex um sort of sales negotiations and it, it it's uh it hasn't quite yet got the i don't think um, the recognition within sales that actually is you don't automatically have to assume that it's just about management mm. you know it can be about business development and there are different levels of that and you, you know clearly you're operating now at the the sort of highest level i would say of of sort of the the large complex sales role and and this is a this is an area that that i um studied really closely when I was doing my doctorate you know I was working at the time with um, the large deal bid pursuit team at Hewlett Packard whilst I was doing my doctorate and it was honestly one of the 
you know, if I look back on my own career, one of the most fun, exciting, exhilarating times of my career, because I was very closely affiliated with the pursuit teams that were involved in in winning sort of really, you know, sort of quite large deals. You know, the, the deal sizes ranged from 20 million up to just under a billion, right. you know, just massive deals. <laughs> And it's a bit like being in the sort of mergers and acquisitions kind of role because there's yep. so much at stake, you know, the, the winning and losing. And, um, yeah, um, but, but, you know, for the great salespeople, it's such a, a brilliant kind of role to be in because you've, you've got, um, you know, you've, you've, you've got the intellectual challenge of how you initiate conversations. You've got the... You know, the differentiation, you know, how are you going to differentiate yourself throughout all, you know, all points of engagement in the sales process as you are working on large deal pursuits. And um, you've got the exhilaration of winning, but you've also got the intense pain of losing because yeah. some, of these, some of these things don't work out. You know, you've got to take the rough with the smooth. You know, that's part of what sales is all about. So. I think most um, so what, interactions, sorry, Phil, most people's yeah. interactions with salespeople for the, if you like, you know, the, the general public, most people's interaction with them are, um, are not necessarily the same interactions as you would have at, you know, the, the, the you know, big deal pursuits. Um, it's, yeah. it's a very different process. It's a lot more complicated and as buyers are becoming increasingly more sophisticated, um, and it's yeah. interesting how the professionalization of buyers and the SIPs courses and, and um, so forth that they can go on. Yeah. Sometimes there isn't that counter um, training um, for salespeople. No, there isn't. Yeah, there are lots no, there of isn't. I mean, out there, but there isn't those real professional recognized bodies yeah. um, out there. Well, there are, but there's not that many. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I mean, that's, that's, you know, clearly an area in which we've been sort of wanting to professionalize and um you know our journey into this large deal pursuit phase started with the um started with the doctorate research which in itself was fascinating but i'll you know maybe refer back to that later but actually the people that i worked with there was a team of there was a core team of about 12 people were so interested in the process of doing the academic research around improving professional practice in sales that they asked if we could create for them a bespoke master's program for their team you know that uh, and because they recognized i think just like you that there's no formal qualification in this area yeah. and this is where our journey into um the master's program started you know back in 2009 and it wasn't something that we did as a company at the time, but we said, why not? You know, we spoke to Middlesex University and we created our first master's uh, program and uh, they put six people through that program, uh, some of whom I hope will be part of our trilogy series as well. So, um, and that, that for me was really interesting because I, I didn't anticipate such an interest in what academic learning can do and you're quite right procurement have been doing this much longer than we have in sales you know yeah. the sips courses that you can do an mba in procurement actually yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. i think that's been around for 30 years or so you yeah. know and and um yet sales you know that sales the professionalization of sales in the context of large deal pursuits. Well, I actually think we run the only masters in it globally. No one else is doing it. So anyway, uh, we need more people out there to, to follow what we're doing really, you know, to get it established as <laughs> in the psyche. But, but it's interesting what you should say about this sort of gap. But I think that you know, perhaps you could explain a bit more about what your current role is, because I think that 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 would be fascinating for the listeners. Okay, so um, we mentioned um, the company Bunzel, um, which is the world's um, leading um, value add distributor. 
Um, and it may not be a necessarily a company that maybe people will recognize, but I can guarantee you, you would have used our products. Um, and Bunzel is a, is a, is a large company. It's, it's 12 billion turnover, um, operating within 31 countries, 22, over 22,000 em employees, um, working within a number of sectors ranging from medical to retail to grocery. Um, and I work for a operating company um, called um, Worldpack, which is based in Eindhoven, which um, supplies into the retail sector. It's very retail focused in, in what, it's, what it's doing. Uh, and the best way to describe, um, yes, effectively, we source product, we consolidate it, and we deliver it anywhere within, within Europe and, and the UK. And I said the best way to describe it would be is if you walk into a store, anything that doesn't have a price tag, I appreciate lots of stores no longer have price tags, but anything that they are, um, they are selling themselves, everything other than that, effectively, we would source and supply to that retailer. And we make sure that there is that brand consistency wherever that brand is in, in the world. So probably the best way to describe what we'll do. Okay. Does. So is and, that... Is that premises as well, or is it what goes into premises? It's, it's, um, and goods, what's called what? goods not for resale or in goods store. Goods not for resale, yeah. So the retail packaging, okay. uniforms, badges, pens, okay. sexy things like toilet rolls and <laughs> things, right. things like that. Everything that the store would need in order to operate. Um, so we don't do okay. thoroughly store fittings and, and things like that, although certain parts of Buns or operational companies around the world do do that. Um, okay. And uh, okay. so my, and I've had the pleasure of working with um, a number of operating companies within Bunzel. I've been there yeah. for around 12 years now, which sounds like an incredibly long time, but um, I've been able to work within a number of their operating companies, predominantly yeah. within the retail sector, but also in the Horeca hospitality and catering and yes. as well. I had a short stint there. So have a real understanding of the marketplace in which we, we operate. Um, and um, in in my roles within those those businesses, it's always mainly been focused around business development. So, either growing a particular client or growing, growing a sector, or more recently within Worldpack, um, um, growing the business, effectively doubling the size of the business in in a, a three to four year window. Um, mm. Worldpack was originally a was a family owned business. One of the good things around Bunzel is it's either a market leader within its sector, either through organic growth or through acquisition. Um, mm. Very inquisitive business. And um, so growth is a, a cornerstone of, of what they, they do. Like I said, they're a FTSE 100 mm -hmm. business, so we're all sort of seeking some, some growth. Um, uh, the, within WorldPack, uh, there was a, it, it was a, a, a privately owned business, which was acquired by Bunzel, and the uh, the original owner of the business is still still in, in it. Uh, he's still the MD, okay. and he brings the entrepreneurial spirit to the business. And uh, yeah, I met him when I was in another operating business, and he he approached and said, "Look, I've got this idea of of doubling the size of the business. Um, would you like to come and join us in in that journey?" And uh, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of pleased to say that by the end of this year, we'd have achieved that. So, um, so great and Amazing. significant growth. And part of that growth is, you know, we've got really talented people within, within our team, um, a, a great team in Eindhoven and, um, yeah, we've had some, you know, growing challenges as, as you'd imagine, but the, the whole team has yeah. been able to you know, unite and, and deliver that. And, uh, I think that the success of our, our growth and success, if I look back onto other operating companies, is having that really clear mission, vision, and values. So aligning mm -hmm. everyone up to a common goal and having some very clear values that, of which we can align ourselves all to. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the, the customer and saying, how can we add value to, to the customer? And is what we're adding, we're seeking to add value to is that valued by the clients and, and the clients okay. that we engage with. And, and I think going back to sort of my journey into sales, I think I've never actually oddly seen myself as a salesperson, always seen myself as a solution provider. And yeah, having that view of how do we add value to the client and being client centric. Um, but then you, but you need everybody within the organization to 
understand what you are trying to deliver, have a very clear value mm-hmm. proposition, which is easily communicated, um, both internally and externally, and then having those clear values that everyone can align themselves to in order to deliver that value proposition. Mm. Um, so we can Could add you, that. Yeah, so, so um, it will be really interesting to understand a bit more the context of the a sort of a sales process that you would go through and to get an idea of, you know, sort of the range of, of size of deals that you tend to find yourself working on, if that's, if that's possible. Yeah. So size, again, it goes back to, um, in, in my career, you know, done incredible, you know, you know large deal. I must admit, I haven't done a billion, um, deals as you, you a have, billion uh, you no have, that's but, very very large i don't think there are too many of those around yeah like but one, um, one certainly you know, 13 million um deals i've done in the past but within world packs growth yeah you know, we looked at um starting at the basics of where has world pack been successful in the past where is where we added value and where do we understand so yeah you know, we were looking at um, certain thresholds say a million and a half, a certain footprint of what a, um, a, a customer, an ideal customer would look like. And oddly that perception has now shifted slightly. Um, we're commonly doing deals of six, you know, six million, um, and, and larger. Yeah. Um, and the process is, is similar. So our conversion rate is quite high. Our conversion rate is about 86% at the moment. So most of what we I go find for. that staggering statistics, which is yeah. very high. Yeah. Which is very high. But yeah. I think that number flatters us a little bit because within the process that we go to in order to identify clients, bearing in mind, the driver is, can we add value? So we will look at a particular client. We will research them heavily and we'll just try to understand what the footprint looks like across Europe. Um, what SKUs do they operate in? Would consolidation be of interest to them are they currently doing it at the moment or, or not mm. what's their long-term objective so we will sit there and read their um, financial reports statements that they they, they release so a lot of prep to really understand what is the drivers within within that business and then we'll also then look and try and seek the individuals within those those businesses so again what is their what could we understand about them and understand what are their drivers against the company goals and could we could we help them achieve those? So, if it's sustainability targets, could we could we help them with that? Um, so, prep is everything, I would say. Um, really understanding them, and then we would approach them with what we believe could be a, a a proposition that will truly add value to them. And also within that process, if we feel that we can't add value to them, then we we may not approach them. Yeah, and all that prep and all that mm-hmm. research could be lost because we think actually that either we're not right for them or they're not ready for us yet. Um, so we may engage with them to talk to them and be very honest and say, well, I don't think you're ready for us. However, we do think in the future we could add some real value. So could we talk to you, talk about what we're doing, what value we're adding for other brands? Uh, admittedly, we have NDAs mm-hmm. in place. So... It's free. I'm not talking about specifics here because I can't, but we will, um, yes. yeah, we will take that general knowledge that we have, um, in the marketplace and, and look at that. Um, we'll also look at the overall, what's going on within the marketplace. What are the trends in the marketplace? So post COVID omni channel within retail, it was there before the pandemic, but it's really come live for retailers. Um, mm-hmm. and what I mean by omni channel is multiple engagement across multiple um, channels so be it connecting your store to your online uh, online um, activity and making sure that those two things are fully aligned or multiple channels are fully aligned um, so the customer experience is common so we would help them maybe with that omni channel we would look at what products they're currently using what logistical frameworks are they using if they're using their own logistics or third party could we do that more efficiently and challenge what they they're doing and sometimes we call ourselves a critical friend so we're not shy at coming back saying you're currently doing this but maybe this may be better for you Um, and sometimes the reaction is no we're pretty happy with what we're doing or 
or you may start um, spark an intrigue um, and then that then yeah. drives the discussion. So making sure we're really prepped, understanding how the, how the client operates, what potentially are their pain points, what do we believe them to be? And then we validate those. So we'll go and find the right person, have a conversation around how, what we believe is going on in the business. They can, they can tell us it's very much that listening process of just starting the journey to formulate a, a solution that can add value. And even at that stage, if we don't think we can add value, we'll walk away. Um, that's, that's fine. Um, and that's where I think we've been successful because we've been really clear on who we target. We understand yeah. them and then we validate it. And then we go into the process of then how, how do we mm. explore further with their engagements, um, to again, how, how, that value. how much of your, um, sort of business development is kind of, as you've described, you know, proactively going out to find customers that you want to do business with versus organizations coming to you saying, um, can you help us in this area or e indeed uh, issuing a tender for the kind of uh, goods not for resale, you know, kind of business and consolidation. We are active in the marketplace. So we, we do connect with a lot of people um, right. and a lot of businesses. Um, so we are very active out there in the marketplace and that may be that, you know, we touch base with them once every six months or maybe even a year, but, um, yeah. but we do have regular content ones that we believe, you know, we understand maybe tendering, we may talk to them more frequently. So there is a mix. We're very active in the marketplace. I would say the majority of the time we go to them, but we do have a okay. significant amount of people who will know who we are and when they have a need, they will pick up the phone and, and contact us. But I would say right. we have spoken to the majority of, uh, we understand our marketplace quite well. And so we, we will be talking to most of the people that we are a bit, are of interest. And sometimes right. we have it where, you know, we happen to call them at the right time, but they will also call us. Yeah. Very okay. proactive. So. So, you, so you're in a market which is well-defined, you know, who are the key players that you want to kind of sell to it's uh, and that's because retail. we've done that work we've done that You've work done we that. understand okay. who so retail is a is a big place um but we yeah. defined we've defined what particular markets we wish to engage yeah. in and that's part of our value proposition and our strategy so yeah. most i would say the yeah the majority of the people in that space yeah we are talk we are talking to in some way or form and then we do thought yeah. leadership um, pieces you may have seen on our LinkedIn posts and uh, recommend people to have a look at Web, uh, World Pack's um, LinkedIn site where we, um, on a bi-weekly basis, we, 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 we pick a topic and I'd like to say we're impartial. You know, we will look at be it omni-channel or challenges within retail and it's not aimed to be a sales um, conversation necessarily. It is... I suppose communicating to to our market that we understand the market, we understand what's going on within it, and we try and then every, you know, bi-weekly take a subject, give a mm. uh, give details, and we put lots of links into um, different reports, and then at the end we may give a a comment or a view on our our take on on mm. that particular subject, mm -hmm. um, and we found that to be useful. You know, we've got increasingly more followers and yeah. more people reading that. When we started, I think we were getting something like 600 reads. We're now up to 355,000 reads per post. So that's okay. grown massively um, for us. But again, it's yeah. that's not necessarily a sales element. It's just a, a way of communicating out to the marketplace. Yeah. Yes, no, I think the lines between marketing and sales are becoming sort of much closer um, and I'm sure Eddie, who's listening to this as well, will be taking note from a from a consalia perspective. Um, you mentioned earlier on about the is sort of operating si system uh, that you have. I, you didn't describe it quite as that, but you talked about the values as being something quite important. Mm -hmm. Do you mind, you know, sharing what are the values that, that that sort of you 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 refer back to when you are working together as a, as a team? Yeah, so um, we have five values within Wolfpack. Um, 
and yeah, we we love shouting about them. Um, so happy to to say what they are. So it's um, yeah. it's take control, be better, be one step ahead, be enthusiastic, and work as a team. So quite general concepts, I guess. Um, and yeah. I think um, when I'm sure the team won't mind me saying it, when I arrived, they were quite internal focused initially. Yeah, um, and we've gone through a process of putting everything through the eyes of the customer. So take control. Right. What does that mean? What's the benefit of that to the client? And we've explored that and broken that down into the departments. So take control may mean one thing to an, um, one of our internal account managers, but maybe something else for one of our um, logistical team members. So, but fundamentally it all comes back to through the eyes of the customer. What, what does that actually right. mean? But also on a strategic level, it, it really drives our business forward of when we're talking about you know, being better, what does that mean from a strategic perspective? Um, mm. How are we better? How do we differentiate ourselves from our competitors? Um, how do we be one step ahead? And actually having that as a value is quite interesting because we are constantly, it's in our DNA that strive yeah. to innovate and to be different and to to drive ourselves forward and how we've then captured those five values is we've tried to then summarize that within um one of our mantras which is uh, service with guts and we talk about that with our client and again it's uh, quite an intangible thing you know service with guts what what does that mean but again it's it is that Untangible element of what makes World Pack different. If you come in, into our head office, you can really feel that. It's that going above and beyond what a customer may expect mm -hmm. and being being brave. Um, I think you have a phrase, tactfully audacious, and uh, which I love. Correct. But uh, <laughs> it's that element of you know, going that one step further. Um, yes, we have processes in place. We have. You know, the clients that we deal with are, are multinational, very recognizable brands. So they need that security that we, you know, we are fully mm. compliant with legislation and fully compliant with their own internal processes. Yeah. But we also understand retail is a very fast paced world. And sometimes, you know, we need to, we need to look at the framework and say, how can we facilitate your speed? How can we be agile? um and support you but within those contractual frameworks that we have and and funny enough we, uh, we talk about i mentioned the pandemic and omni channel but if i look at the pandemic um when that hit you know, i think that was not in anyone's five-year plan therefore people weren't necessarily prepared for it and we were for one particular retailer who contacted us and said look yeah we, we see this covid coming we don't really understand what it means for our business at that point yeah, everything wasn't locked down at that perspective. But they said, right, we would like face masks. We would like hand sanitizer. We would like some signage. How fast could you get that to our, to all of our stores, mm. all of our stores across Europe? And they have a big footprint. And we are able to mobilize that within three days, and get the products, right. get it distributed, get into the stores um, incredibly quick. Um, mm. But that was also the power of Bunzel, where we have a healthcare business who has hand sanitizer and face masks in their organization right. as a standard product. And we were able to then leverage that um, for the benefit of the yeah. client. That's fascinating. Fascinating. The, the mindsets that, you know, the research that I did, which I think you've <laughs> looked at before. Yep. Yeah, we described these four sales mindsets as being uh, around authenticity, client centricity. You, mm -hmm. You've mentioned client centricity earlier. Yep. Uh, proactive creativity. It's this, this idea of not waiting for customers to come up with ideas, um, but actually it's, it's something that, that um, customers really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said earlier, the, the idea of the other, it, it, it's the courage, it's the tactful audacity and, in being bold and having the confidence to be able to take those ideas forward as being the four sort of guiding principles that we we think are well we know are important for for any kind of sale whether it's large deal or smaller deal in fact mm. um so it's 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 it, it 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 was very interesting that you talked about values and i know we've talked about it 
you know, before the podcast, you know, we talked about the importance of values and um, it's something that I honestly found when I was doing my research, even getting my work published that people didn't really, it wasn't in the lexicon of sales language at the time. It was value-based selling, not values-based selling yep. was talked about. You know, people talk about value all the time, but values, that's a mm. kind of fluffy, a fluffy topic, but we, we, we know how important it is to customers that they, they deal with and they select suppliers based on the values that they demonstrate. So it's really, really great to hear you say that. I wonder whether I could ask you to think of, you know, within your career, you've obviously had some amazing wins and uh, maybe some losses. And I wonder whether, without mentioning names, of course, but whether you could talk us through um, an example of how you've approached a particular prospect um, or customer and, and you know, uh, perhaps a deal that you're particularly proud of winning. I don't know. Uh, and kind of talk through about what, what made, you know, what made it for you? What, what was, what, what, uh, what was it about that particular opportunity that, uh, that sort of puts it right up there in, in maybe your top, you know, one of your top wins? Um, I think I've been fortunate to work with, uh, quite a number of brands who, um, yeah, you know, recognizable brands and sort of seeing how they, um, how, how they operate. And I try to think of what, yeah, I am. Um, yeah. I've, one way I think I'm, we are as a, as a team quite proud of, because we I was explaining how we research a, a client and yeah. we, 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 um, we had a, a, an approach for an RFI, um, an RFP and we, We'd done our work on, on the on the client. We understood how they operated. We understood how they currently managed it. So we received an RFP and we looked at it. Uh, if we're being honest, what they've asked for is not necessarily what they need. And that's quite a bold place to be, where you're looking at it saying, oh, okay, so how do we approach this to the clients? Because they've obviously done a lot of work. Um, and they've they put a really good tender pack together, and then you've got ourselves looking at it, going, "I don't really think that's really what you want." So we were quite um, bold in going back to that particular client and saying, yeah, "Thank you, we'd like to take part, obviously, but could we just float past this idea to you that there may be a different way of approaching this?" and they were they were brilliant in the fact that they just they didn't say no they they mm. kind of said well okay right we'd like you to quote for what we've asked for but let's explore this other thing that you're offering of, of which we did and we ended up talking to multiple stakeholders within their business you know senior people um and we and we pitched this idea um of doing it in a slightly different way and yeah to their credit they were very open to it and happy to explore and put some resource behind exploring what we were offering them. And, mm. and yeah, we, we secured that business in the new framework that we, we had. And I think it was that, um, I think <laughs> our audaciousness to kind of go back to them and, and yeah. present something different based on knowledge. So we weren't just saying, oh yeah, our value proposition is this, you need to fit into our value proposition. It was very much that customer centric. We believe this will be beneficial to you. This will add value to your operation. Yeah. It will make your operation more efficient and allow it to focus on what you do best. And we could take some of that pain away from you and manage it a different way. Um, like mm. I, said, I can't say who the brand is, but um, yeah, no. they, they were really supportive in that process. Yeah. Um, I'm quite proud of that because it was, it was a quite a bold step and we've done that now numerous times where we've challenged a client as a sort of thing you know, that critical friend of yes you've asked for this but if you do it like this there could be some wins for you and but also at that that point of view of being in a process where we've actually walked away from it where we've looked at it mm. and and it would be very easy for us to have said yeah we, you know, we'll quote we'll put a proposal together but we've been very honest of saying you know, this is just not right for our 
for us and therefore mm. we don't think we can add value to you as a customer or as a client so therefore we're not going to take part um yeah and a part of our process also is we we do seek feedback um from when we win business yeah we obviously celebrate as a team when we won um a, a client um and you know celebrating with with the client as well when we've won it but also seeking that feedback as to okay well why did we win it what was the deciding mm -hmm. factor and yeah commercials are always you know price is always um maybe at the forefront but it's not the sole driver of the decision making for the client and i think if you can really goes back to the prep if you can understand what the business overall objectives are yes buying well uh and you know, adding value is not always about price. It could be other things that are the motivators for the client. So really mm. understanding a you know, real deep understanding of what is driving the client's decision and the individual stakeholders decision to award the business. What are they looking for? You know, um, and, mm. and aligning yourself to that if you can, um, and being authentic in what you are offering that client. So yeah, not, not overselling what you, what you can offer, but truly trying to align yourself, but also pushing the business. Yeah. Um, you know, we are constantly, I've mentioned before, you know, constantly driving ourselves at Worldpack to be innovators. And I certainly see you know, part of my role as business development director is to, is to push, is to challenge as my, as my mm. colleagues will say on a regular basis, because mm. again, it's. If we're not striving and we're not pushing, we're not trying hard enough. And, yeah. um, and you, but you need your team. I think business development is truly a team sport. Uh, it's a, a team activity. Um, you, know, you need your operational team on board, customer service on board, operations, finance. You, you need those alignments. And, um, you know, I'm delighted that at World Pack, we have an amazing team who are able to sort of facilitate. Mm. Growth, you know, doubling the size of a business as sizable as world pack in a relatively short period of time creates and needs good people doing mm. you know, their best constantly and, and yeah. that can be tiring and challenging but we have a team who 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 uh, love that challenge and step up to it on a day-to-day -day basis yeah there's um i remember one of the interviews that i did with uh customer of one of our customers and um and he was saying that um when we talk about salesmanship and he said uh, <clears throat> he said i want a good salesperson but i don't want him pointing at me i want him pointing back inside his own company mm. so that he can leverage my power and weight back inside his company in order that i can benefit from all points of engagement and this I mean, to your point about team is so important is that with these large deal kind of pursuits, it's, it's a big team effort. I, I remember in some of the deals that we worked on with HP, we had some of the largest, we had a team of 40 people actually working, solution architects, project managers, legal, people with specialist skills in writing, you know, mm. writing bids. Um, yeah. um, the you know the account managers the engagement leads it's a huge team of people um and unless you are you know working you know towards a common purpose a common aim um then customers will sense you know if there are cracks in the system right. uh, one of the other people that we interviewed uh, actually a retail was starbucks and uh, i remember going over to seattle and interviewing the starbucks organization about what they look for from their suppliers mm -hmm. and one of them made this quote um I don't know starbucks maybe one of your customers as well but one one of them made uh, the quote that it's you know very often you can find a great person at the front but they don't necessarily have the people behind mm. that can make you know these significant projects work um and so very true it's interesting go yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and also to your topic of innovation is that uh, another quote from someone else at Starbucks um, uh, who is in a, you know, they had a small team that they called 
um, their innovation team actually, and this person was 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 looking at all the innovation projects at Starbucks. A young lady from just fresh out of Harvard, actually, very bright, and she said finding that golden individual that can come up with that unique idea is is what we try and do and it's hard to find and so to your point about pushing boundaries and about you know always challenging yourself that good is not good enough Hmm. i think is it's important and and that's what we did um you know, during those early days when we took those values and we said, well, how do we take something like client centricity, which is a term that everyone uses, to be honest, but actually put it on steroids? You know, how can we, how can we do it much more? And yeah. one of the things that we did, which, was, which helped us get deep knowledge quicker, was we actually went out to the investment analysts and who were talking to these companies and we said, can we, can we pay you to come in and give us a one hour, two hour workshop on the drivers that this business is facing? And often these people also had connections with the main boards of these companies. And so, you know, they, they, they were careful in what they were able to talk about. But, you know, we, we found those amazingly rich sources of data um, that fed into the whole prep phase, if you like, going back to what you described earlier. So that's just an example. But I I just want to share one other, which is which I've written about in the book, to your point about um, questioning people's RFPs. And, and, And we had this uh, uh, the same situation where an R- RFP had come into this, um, in, in fact, it came in to a general information email address, and yeah. uh, but it was a big deal. It was like it was a two hundred and fifty million dollar deal. <laughs> you know, this RFP came in because the client didn't the the client didn't know who to send it to because they didn't have an account manager at yeah. this organization that they knew of. Anyway, came in. And, you know, a group of 12 of us got together and um, we looked at it and actually it could have been written. It could have been written for my client. It was perfect. You know, it was, this is everything we can do. Hmm. And so we said, well, let, let's think about these values. Let's think about, you know, how do we progress? Because normally they would go into a room, a war room, as they called it, and they would, you know, huddle around Excel spreadsheets and start putting all their pricing things together and coming up with a solution based on this, this like you said, well-documented RFP. And they, they said, no, we just don't know the client well enough. You know, we don't have an account manager. We don't have a relationship. So hmm. let's back out of this one. And, but let's send them a carefully worded letter. And they, they sent this letter, which was, yeah, thanks so much for sending us the RFP. It was written as if it was for us, but we feel on this occasion we just can't respond. But thank you so much for thinking of us. And it could have gone one of two ways. And the, the client actually phoned them back and said, look, we really want you to pitch for this. Mm. We know that you can do it. And they said, what can we do to help you get to know us or, you know, to help you mm. write it? And they said, well, can we get to know you? And they, they went to this meeting that they had in London and sat with the technologists of this company and they got a real sense that they they wanted to get rid of the incumbent you know because that 80 percent of these deals go to the incumbents mm. typically from from this particular sector we're in um but they sensed that they really weren't happy and they were going to move to someone else so that that was good and they they built up good personal rapport the team came back from this meeting and we said okay what next do we respond to the rfp and we said actually we still don't know them well enough Mm. you know we met their technologists but we need to see who their customers are and so this was a big mine it's it's published this so i can mention that it's anglo american the the, the, you know the the big mining company and Mm. and uh, they visited they actually went out visiting the mines and um to find out, is it possible to give a two-hour response time if a server goes down? You know, they realized yep. it was impossible, and what was in the RFP could not be delivered. Yeah. Um, but to your point about innovation 
It was interesting. In, in some of the other conversations that took place at the mines, they found out that what kept the general manager awake at night was knowing where people were in the mine. Because mm. if you can't, if you don't know where people are, you have to close the mine. There could be a problem. Yeah. And uh, the company that we were doing this work with had this innovation coming out of a lab in Bristol, which was enabled to track people easily. And they suggested that it wasn't in the RFP, but go go and visit the, the lab. And um, and this really opened up this area of innovation and technology, a, a subject of conversation that wasn't part of the RFP, but something that the what became a client really valued. Mm. And you're really demonstrating, uh, aren't you, that partnership approach even before you've run the business of yeah, we really are yes. wanting to be a partner and understand your operation and understand the business. Yeah. You put yourself in the client's perspective. The journey, even before it started, has been a positive one. It is, but not every not every client you know, some clients are so fixed that they're stuck to, the, you know, they're not ready. So you need two parties, like you yeah. were saying earlier, you know, two parties to um, want to engage in that way. And it's the skill of the approach. I love the way that you use the word float. I'd love to float this idea by you. It's not like a sales pitch. It's, mm. it's an idea. And um, it, it's a non-sales or, you know, I'm also, you, know, you don't see yourself as a salesperson, but you are clearly a salesperson yeah. in what you do, you know, and your success has a lot to say for that. But it's it's the subtlety of the sort of emotional intelligence that you need in these complex deals, you know, driven by, I don't know, driven by a genuine interest in wanting to help add value to their business, which which is what carries a lot of these deals to a successful conclusion. I wonder... I wonder if in the final sort of 10 minutes or or whatever of our conversation, if you reflect on the, you know, what your key learning, I mean, maybe you've shared many of them already in the storytelling that you've done, but what for you, for someone in your kind of role as a large deal, you know, business development director, what what are the critical skills? What are the critical attributes do you think you need to have to be successful in in the role that you're doing we've kind of touched on them i think i think it's that um being able to be, be genuinely interested in the client um mm. wanting to listen to what they're telling you and taking that information away and i think that one of the drivers for myself has always been you know authentic and hopefully always authentic, but also always wanting to add, add value. And that requires you to genuinely invest yourself into the client that you are trying to secure from a business development perspective. So really trying to understand their world, listen to what they're telling you, and then being able to look at the business in which you're operating on and saying, can we add value? And then questioning what they've told you based on the knowledge that you have, um, your knowledge of your business, what's going on in the marketplace, so that you can really come back to them with something that truly adds value. And that, like I say, and, and be bold. It's very comfortable and very easy just to f follow the line of saying, well, okay, yeah. Yeah, you've, you've, they've asked for this. If I deliver them that, then they'll be happy um, because I've fulfilled the brief. I think where uh, I've been successful in the past has always been, okay, if the, what they've asked for absolutely makes sense, then fine. But be, be that critical friend, challenge them, and also challenge your internal stakeholders as well. Of to, to, mm. yeah. The amount of times, I suppose the other thing I'd say is never take no for an answer. Um, I, I joke to my colleagues all the time of saying, my world is gray. It's not black and white, it's just different shades of gray. Um, and as a business, you know, we are in a very different place than we were three, four years ago. And I think because some down to myself and some down to other colleagues of constantly pushing. And when we get a no, 
it is trying to understand it. Are you saying no because it's hard or it's a little bit scary or um, just don't want to do it? You know, mm. to me, they aren't, they aren't the, um, they aren't the, they aren't good enough reasons. Yeah. Sometimes a no means a no. It could just be that, yeah, you say, well, okay, that clearly just cannot happen because of X, Y, Z. And often I'll, I'll say to my colleague, explain to me why then. And you can understand, you can kind of weigh and go, okay, yeah, I absolutely get that. That means, you know, the no is a hard no. It just, it can't, it can't be done. But sometimes you, you can look at it and say, well, okay, well, if we did this, 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 would that generate a better outcome? What are the challenges associated to that? Um, and it could be, I don't know, a more senior stakeholder. So they need to get their approval. And then, okay, well, I can help facilitate that conversation. Yeah, we'll go together. We'll have that conversation and we'll see the challenges mm -hmm. up. And I think the business is, yeah, luckily, we're um, the business and we're certainly within Willpack. And, you know, Bun's always that desire to, to innovate. So mm. I would also say, yeah, challenge a no, be it from a client or from internal stakeholders, be prepared to question and, and to mm. push because you never know what the outcome may be. It may, it may be an absolute better outcome than you had. And I always have in my head, um, I use this a lot, so it will resonate, I think, with some of my colleagues. I talk about Roger Bannister, um, Bannister in 1954 oh, yeah. doing the four minute mile. And you know, the, the thinking at the time by all experts were saying you know, a human cannot run a four minute mile. It's biologically impossible and you know, it can't be done. It was only when he ran that four minute mile that it was possible. And within a year later, three people, bearing in mind it was impossible up to the point that he had done it. Three people then ran a four minute mile a year, year later. So mm. the only thing that changed was it was now possible. Mm. And I think that's quite, I also think that's quite a powerful story. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, that yeah, you, know, you should drive. I don't know if I've necessarily answered your question necessarily, but. Well, no, I think you have. It's, no, it's I... a desire to push. Yeah, uh, but there's there's something else which um, you mentioned this twice. Um, what, one is uh, you, you talked about entrepreneurial. You know, if you're looking at what motivates, you, you clearly have got a not entrepreneurial approach to the way you do things. I mean, you 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 run your own business as well in the, your past career, and and you mentioned the CEO of the company is very entrepreneurial. You know, as well. Yeah, the MD and, of Pack, yeah. As, as, is, yeah. Um, as is the CEO of Bunzel, Frank Van yeah, he's an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur. So you've got this entrepreneurship, you know, the, this, I suppose, what, you know, how, if you break that down in what does an entrepreneur, what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur? You know, um, is it, is it, um, is it the challenge? Is it the ability to take risk? Um, is it um, that failure is not negative? You know, doesn't matter if you fail as long as you learn. Yep. You know, absolutely. So, so, so I think I think that maybe you've got some of these innate, you know, as part of who you are because you've you know you've not been formally, if you like, professionally trained in these areas, but it's part of your makeup. Is you you've clearly got an entrepreneurial approach to life yeah. i would say and you've applied that to the way that you look at deals i would imagine yeah i think i probably very flattering but yeah i i agree i suppose um that mindset um one thing i think has been also benefits and one of the benefits of working for Bunzel is the training programs that they have. So, yeah, um, and I've certainly enjoyed since joining them and, and in my sort of 12 years at, at Bunzel, being exposed to quite a lot of, of training and um, abilities, mm. especially when I first joined. Um, and that, I think, married with whatever natural ability I may have or you know, personality, whatever, having then that that knowledge to fall back on, which I suppose then falls into your world, Phil, of having the, uh, having a master's in, in sales. Yeah. I understand what the strategies are. Um, I understand yes. the different sales techniques, be it spin, need-based, consultative selling, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever name you want to put on it. I, I understand those mechanics now. And yeah. you can 
you can then mirror that entrepreneurship against hard training and knowledge and therefore you can filter that through but then ultimately i think i think the other thing i would say as a is heart and mind is great but often your gut reaction to a situation or a, mm-hmm. a view is is oddly sometimes more powerful um um and often you know um my gut feeling on something tends to be right you don't necessarily know why why it is but um often it's proved to be correct and um so therefore mm. so, you know sometimes listen to your gut but make informed decisions i would say yeah yeah that's brilliant well i think we are literally running yeah. to the end of our yeah, time sorry yes yeah, so i, I do need to, to uh, shoot off I, I, a huge thank you for your time and sharing your experience with us and um Pleasure. Uh, maybe Enjoy. we could invite you back on some future episode at some point. But anyway, thank you, David. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you for yours.